Women are powerful creators. The Align Women podcast features female entrepreneurs, leaders, and other professional women who've demonstrated agency and innovation in their personal and professional lives. I'm your host, Amy Evans. I have authentic, intimate conversations with my guests that highlight their paths to success, their struggles and accomplishments, and the things that currently excite, motivate, and inspire them to turn their visions into reality. Welcome to the Align Women podcast. I'm Amy Evans, your host and the founder of Align Women, a leadership and networking organization for professional women. This podcast features female entrepreneurs, leaders, and other professional women who've demonstrated agency and innovation in their personal and professional lives. With me today is Marissa Garcia. Marissa is a certified specialist in estate planning, trust, and probate law, and she's the managing partner, managing attorney at Gold Law in Camarillo, California. Welcome to the podcast, Marissa. Hi, Amy. Thank you for having me. I am so happy to have you here today. And we're going to do a little education session to get started. For people who aren't familiar with the term, and there may be some, describe what estate planning is all about. Generally speaking, estate planning is the sort of the plan or the process that you put into place so that after you pass away, your assets can be distributed to the beneficiaries that you select, whether it's your children, your friends, other family members, charities, so that you can designate who you want your assets to go to, as opposed to following the preset schedule that the probate code and the state has mandated if you don't have a will or a trust in place. Got it. And I have heard people say that if you don't have an estate plan, the state of California has one in place for you, and it's probably not going to go the way that you would have wanted it to go. And that's one of the reasons it's important to document what you want to have happen, right? Yes, absolutely. They do have a, a schedule. It kind of follows the, generally speaking, the the family line, but you may not want it to be that way. So that's why estate planning is a, is a good uh, thing to have in place. And just if I, the other thing that I think is really important part of estate planning that sometimes is off, overlooked is the planning for yourself if you are incapacitated. Because estate planning, while it does deal with after death, it can also deal with that time period where you may lack capacity, you may have Alzheimer's or dementia or some other um, condition that will prevent you from managing your own finances or making your own medical decisions. And so similarly, Rather than going to court and having the court be involved in that process, a solid estate plan can help you designate those people to act on your behalf when you're not able to. That's really important because obviously there's lots of conditions and situations that could create a scenario like that. And almost all of them are unexpected. And, and that impacts, yeah, how you get treatment, how you pay for treatment, how mortgages are paid and paychecks are cashed and all of those things that nobody really wants to think about, but becoming extremely important when there's some sort of incapacitation, super important. When you talk about assets, let's talk about what assets are for a minute, because I think Mm -hmm. some people might hear the term assets and think, well, I don't have stocks and bonds and gold bars sitting in my closet at home. So why do I need an estate plan for like my beat up old car in the driveway and, and the couple thousand dollars in my checking account? So what, when you say assets, what are those things, what comes into play there? Sure. Generally speaking, it can be cash accounts. It can be retirement accounts. It can be real property. It could include cars, other investments that you may have that are not maybe designated in some other way, like a paid on death beneficiary, that kind of thing. But in California, the dollar amount in order to push you over to a probate requirement is, I think, 166500 this year. Mm-hmm. And so it's a relatively small amount. I mean, if an average person has a, a retirement piece of real property in California, they are easily going to be kicked over that limit. And if you don't have that plan in place, then that's where you're going to be is most likely is probate court. Mm. And, and when we're considering assets, one important thing to remember in a probate estate, when asset values are calculated, they're calculated based on gross value. 
So you may have an excellent piece of property in California that's worth a million dollars and your mortgage is 900,000. But for the estate calculation purpose, you have a million dollar asset. Mm -hmm. And so when attorney fees and personal representative fees are calculated, they're based on that $1 million asset, not the net value of that Mm -hmm. asset. So the cost of probate is pretty significant based on the assets that fall into there. So you don't necessarily need uh, an overwhelming estate value to put you into, into court, into probate. Interesting. Okay. And an, another thing that I, I, I believe falls under assets I, that I didn't hear you mention, but I think as families get more complicated, this becomes important is items of sentimental value. So if you've got grandpa's car and you really want grandpa's car to go to your third son because you guys worked on it together. If you haven't specified that, then the way that assets would be distributed in probate, that may not happen. And so that's another reason to be specific about what you want. Could be an old piece of jewelry. It could be a piece of property. It could be a car. It could be, but being able to specify what you want to have happen to those things becomes important. And also you did mention charities. There are a lot Lots of people who say, I want a percentage of my assets to to the value of those to be donated to a charity when I die. And so that's mm-hmm. another thing that you can use an estate plan to spell out, right? Yes, absolutely. In fact, specific distributions, especially things of that sentimental value are sometimes the most important when we, especially when we get into maybe litigation or contested matters, sometimes it's really family members arguing over that artwork or that mom's jewelry, things like that, that don't necessarily have a high financial value, but it's an emotionally charged object for the family. And so having that already written in place can sometimes save those expensive battles after the fact. And the other thing that's really great for an estate plan is just if you have maybe children with special needs that may be receiving some kind of public benefit, or if you have minor children who would potentially be receiving a share of your estate, your your trust can help account for all of those scenarios so that we're maybe not having a guardianship of the estate as well, or we're dealing with Medi-Cal benefits being discontinued or disqualified because now that adult child is receiving a large sum of money. Mm. So it allows a, a variety of different things that you can protect and control. Got it. And I imagine as families get more complex where there are multiple marriages, two, yeah. three, even three marriages with children from multiple marriages, that being able to lay all of this out in a way that is intelligent and thoughtful is it becomes even mm-hmm. more important because all those lines of ownership and possession and inheritance are not as clear as families get more and more complicated. That's true too. Like So if you're in a second marriage or there's children from multiple um, marriages, you can account for that in your estate plan that you wouldn't be able to if you didn't. So I think the answer to this is relatively obvious given everything that you've shared up to this point, but what are the benefits of working with an attorney like you to establish an estate plan versus a a DIY sort Mm -hmm. of, I downloaded a fill in the blank uh, legal Zoom sort of version of an estate plan off the internet. What do you get from working with an estate plan attorney that you wouldn't get if you were doing this yourself? I think one of the obvious benefits is that you have the expertise um, and the, the experience to know what we should be talking about, what we should be including in your estate plan. And hopefully you're also avoiding those expensive mistakes. So for example, I had a, a client early on who used, as you mentioned, a, a fill in the blank uh, will or trust, I forget which one it was, that she picked up at Staples in, in the 80s, I want to say. And the part where she was supposed to designate beneficiaries, she left that part blank. And she was uh, not married and didn't have kids. So we, we had to go into probate and we had to get all that figured out for her. So these little things like that can make a big difference. One other sort of important part of it is even if you use legal zoom or something like that to create your trust you still have to fund your trust so it's not just a matter of signing this this big wonderful document 
but you actually have to move those assets into the trust in order for it to be an effective document, an effective trust agreement. And that's something that we also help you with, like transferring title to your real property. So you now hold it in the name of your, we review your retirement assets and things like that. Some are better to be, some assets you might want to name in the trust, others you might want to have designated beneficiaries. So we can talk to you about that and explain the pros and cons uh, about how that would work and how that would impact the overall estate. Those are just a few kind of tips, but it's that's why it's important. And hopefully you're writing things out with an attorney that's a little less ambiguous than if you're doing it at home on your own, because if it's unclear to whoever is administering your estate, the only way for them to really clarify what you meant is to go into court and file a petition for instruction. Mm. And that's contrary to what they probably intended would happen. So it's yeah. better to meet with someone and, and just try to do it correctly the first time. And really what you're what you're doing, I've heard people call estate plans like a, like a love letter to your family. What you're doing is you're trying to make the process mm-hmm. after you pass or when you're incapacitated as easy as possible for them. It is already an incredibly traumatic time, no matter how it came to pass. And, and so making it easier for them and smoothing the way is really a loving and and caring thing to do. And then sometimes it's a matter of just being able to function. I I certainly am Mm -hmm. aware of stories about one spouse going into being in, in, in an accident or having an illness where they're incapacitated, but all the financers were controlled by the, the Mm -hmm. sick spouse and the well spouse while dealing with the medical situation also doesn't have access to the money to pay the mortgage or buy groceries or pay for childcare or any of the other things they need. And that's a Mm -hmm. terrible situation. And that going back to what you were saying about not only dealing with what happens when someone passes, but also what happens when they're incapacitated is super important so that the, the well spouse can take care of matters. Absolutely. And especially also if you're maybe a small business owner, and you're the only one on the business accounts. Who's going to now, not only for your family, but maybe you have employees that still need their paycheck and things like that. That that part of estate planning and succession planning is very important. And it's a, it's a really important benefit of having that estate plan in place. Totally makes sense. And here's another question that I think is obvious given the conversation that we've had so far, but Knowing you and having had the pleasure of spending time with you in the Align Women Networking Mastermind for a while, I know that you love what you do. Talk about why you love what you do. I think one of my favorite parts about estate planning is getting to talk to clients and getting to know them. And because of what we're doing, I get to know all about them, Mm -hmm. their family, their where their money, everything like that. And it's just, it's so fun to talk to clients, especially perhaps maybe elderly clients who the stories I hear sometimes about when they were stationed somewhere during World Mm -hmm. War II, or, you know, how I love to always ask how they met their spouse, because they love to tell that story. And and it's just a bit of of informal history that I get to, to share in. And not only does it give me that great knowledge and and background about them, but I'm also in that circumstance I'm testing their capacity a bit to make sure mm. that they their long-term memory is still good. They know who their family is. They know who their assets are. But I get to hear these wonderful stories and get to know my clients beyond what you might in a in any sort of corporate setting or thing, things like that. So I love that it has the the family and the emotional connection that I can build with my clients. But I also like the sort of the puzzle piece of it because sometimes that's what we're doing in, in maybe administering a trust after the fact or creating an estate plan. If there's certain challenges or unique circumstances, I kind of like to, to work out those provisions and see how we can make this work and think of the what if this happens, then we need to add a provision for this. So there's a problem solving aspect of it that I enjoy as well. That totally makes sense. And that leads into something that you mentioned in our conversation in preparing for uh, the podcast. You mentioned the Gallup Strengths Finder, and that was actually something that I wasn't familiar with before you mentioned it. I know a lot of the other sort of 
personality and strengths mm-hmm. tests that are used particularly in professional situations to, to, to determine what you're good at. But tell me what you learned when you took that and how it applies to what you do. In your- it's almost right on point. So we, I'm in, I'm part of this other networking group. It's women to women, and it's a group of amazing women professionals. And so this year to kick off the year, we all took the the test and then there was, we had a meeting about it and we discussed what our top five strengths are and things like that. So I never done it before. So I took the test also. And one of my top five was restorative. And so what that one I think means is that I enjoy, or one of my strengths is related to problem solving, to get to the root of the problem and come up with different approaches to fix things. And I think that is something that that I commonly do, especially in litigation matters where we tend to focus sometimes on mediation as opposed to going to court for a full trial. And mediation is really where you can come up with these creative solutions to try to address everybody's concerns and kind of fix the problem. Because a lot of times it's not really the dispute over the finances or who's getting what. There's uh, a whole host of emotional history that that goes into it, especially when there's perhaps siblings that are warring or over t- trust distribution or things like that. It's more about what happened when they were maybe ch- children or, or how mom and dad treated them and, and that kind of thing. All of these things are playing in their mind mm-hmm. as we're working through this case. And so that restorative strength focuses on that, looking at the root of the problem and coming up with, with solutions. That so it's totally a really interesting sense. experience. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I have had the pleasure of taking some of those and I find that they are incredibly accurate and really interesting. And at this point in our careers, validating. Uh, we're, right. we're not taking them so much to go, what should I be when I grow up? But but taking them and, and finding out really why we're good mm-hmm. at what we do. I, I think a lot of people end up in certain careers because it's the mechanics of what that career mm-hmm. allows them to do. And for you, the this area of law allows you to do that problem solving and that and and flex that restorative muscle. And I think that's really neat that you got that insight. So talk to me about your practice for a minute. I learned something that I didn't know about you, which is that when you joined the firm, it was a more broad practice and you really worked to focus it where it is now on trusts and estate Mm -hmm. planning and guardianships. Tell me what that process was like and why you found that area of law to be a worthwhile focus. Sure. Like you mentioned, it was a more general civil practice and being a new attorney when we would get new cases, I, I wouldn't necessarily know all of the things that you should know about, maybe a personal injury or a family law case. So we we're devoting a lot of time to researching and, and coming up with how we answer it and, and spending so much time on trying to have some general knowledge about a variety of different areas. And what I really wanted to do was do something in a smaller area, perhaps, but do it well and have that expertise. Because I think that also plays into my confidence level too, when I'm talking to somebody and and having that knowledge and knowing that's the right answer, that is what the code, knowing the procedure, it it helps build your comfort and your confidence and that kind of shows. And we just really enjoyed this area. I really enjoyed this area because it does have that family role and aspect but it's a little bit different than family law because that was something that I was also debating a little bit about whether I wanted to pursue family law. And it just, we're not necessarily doing custody battles here and things like that. And that was something I was, I quickly learned I did not enjoy. Mm -hmm. I did a few of those, but we just liked this area. And one of the nice things about the conservatorship practice that we also have is that we can also help propose conservatees who are often, um, suffering from some form of dementia or Alzheimer's, or in another, in another sense, uh, those with developmental disabilities, perhaps Mm -hmm. autism and things like that. So I'm on a a panel with both the court in Ventura and LA, where we are appointed to serve as counsel for those proposed conservatives. And we get to be their voice and advocate for what they want to say and what perhaps in some cases their best interest. Um, when they're not necessarily able to communicate wow. that for themselves. 
So it's really a kind of comprehensive thing that we're doing here in the office. And we have bits and pieces. We have the estate planning part. We have the administration part that's after death. And then we do have the litigation part as well. But I, I, to circle back to what you were saying, I just, having that expertise in one area was just a, a bit more comforting and just, we just really like the area that we're in. And, and the probate bar in general, the attorneys that are working in trust and estates are usually a bit more cordial and a bit more easier to work with than perhaps your general civil attorney. So it's a, a nice fit for us. I know other female attorneys who have chosen their paths in law the same way, looking for the less confrontational, less aggressive <laughs> forms of practicing law because not all right. people are attracted to right. <laughs> that the having the everyday confrontations with other yeah. attorneys. Yeah, absolutely. We could do it if we had to, but I don't necessarily want that to be my day to day. For know? sure. For sure. I get that. So I'm going to, I'm going to end on a, a question that I ask so many of the women that become guests on the podcast. You work in a male dominated field and what kind of challenges has that presented to you? What have you experienced in your career and, and how have you overcome it? And I'm just going to, I'm just going to throw one answer in there by becoming managing attorney at your own firm is one way to overcome that, which I think is is a super cool thing, but tell me what your experience has been like. Sure. Sure. It's funny that just this Wednesday, I went to a mediation and it was back in person and I, I checked in at the reception office and I just gave my Marissa Garcia for the Smith matter. And, and so I sat down and the receptionist called the attorney and she said, oh, the court reporter is here. And I thought, oh, and I corrected her very politely, but it's not, it's unfortunately, it's not the first time that's happened. No. And it's one of my very first depositions when I was in my first year of practice, I had a similar experience and it's continued throughout. But I tend to be less angry than I was the first time it happened or the fifth time it happened. But but I just need to bring myself back. And I have this quote on my, I have two quotes on my desk that I, I look to. And I, one that says, you can't be heard if you don't speak. And the other one that I always look to is, there's a reason that you were invited. So you need to find your voice. Mm. And And so I just, I try to bring myself back into that place. I am generally a bit more of a soft-spoken person. I can use that a little bit to my advantage now. And I just have to be me. When I make headway bit by bit and and those who know me and and I can I can I don't necessarily need to be a brash, aggressive attorney to fit into that still somewhat male dominated world. And I think as I continue to practice, I realize that a bit more. That I can practice the way that I want to, and I can still be heard. But you're still going to have those, the unconscious bias that's there. There's still going to be opposing counsel who, even though knows I'm the lead attorney on the case, continues to send all the emails to my senior attorney here, who's a male. I just have to go with it and do the best that I can for my own sanity and for the benefit of my client. Yeah, And be a, a representative. So hopefully the woman that you correct, kindly corrected, (laughs) has a realization that perhaps she's making assumptions that aren't right. And that being the attorney on the case is available to her too, if that's what she decides she wants to do. Right. Yeah. And and it does surprise me sometimes that it is, it's comments from women as much as it is comments from men. Yeah. I had a client a few years back where we, we were successful in a matter relating to her husband's advanced healthcare directive. And we took it to a trial and, and I won and she won her you know point of view and position. And then when her husband passed away and there was litigation, she came in and said, I think we really need to have a male attorney in the courtroom to be strong about this. And I thought, but we won last time. <laughs> like, wow. It was so disappointing. But at this point, I'm of the position, well, if you don't want me, then I don't want you either. <laughs> and I'm, I'm feeling good about that. 
I think that's a good position to be in and, and kind to yourself and willing to let other people have their own biases and limitations and just let them be on their way. And you get to one of the joys of being an entrepreneur and building your own business is that you get to work with the people you want to work with. So I support that a hundred percent. So where can people find you if they would like to connect with you? Sure. So we have our website, goldlawcorp.com. And I'm also on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook, though not as much, but you, you can find us there. And then just the website has all of our contact information. Perfect. And we will share that with everybody on the podcast website so they can easily connect with you. Thank you so much for joining me on the Align Women podcast today, Marissa. It was great to have you. Thank you. I really am glad I I came on and and I really had a good time talking with you. I'm so glad. Look for more episodes with more amazing women at alignwomenpodcast.com. Thanks for listening to the Align Women Podcast. You can find more episodes with more amazing women at alignwomenpodcast.com and visit alignwomen.org to learn more about our leadership and networking organization. This is Amy Evans, and you've been listening to the Align Women Podcast. 